May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is a portion of the Old Testament read a moment ago. I recall your attention to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 22, verse 28, where we read again that portion of God's Word. And the afflicted people thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. So far the text. In the name of him who died for our sins so that we will not die for them, who died in our place as our substitute under God's wrath, the Lord Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating and preserving triune God. This morning, we began this worship service with what we will call a confession of sins. All of us who participated said in a prayer to God, I am a sinner. I deserve nothing from you, God, but your wrath and punishment for my sins. I have broken your commandments in every way possible not just by outward acts, but even in my heart. I have not loved you and your law and your commandments, but I have sinned. Now that's not unusual for us in this church because almost all the time that we have a worship service here, we begin a worship service with that same confession. And I want to ask you, when you begin a worship service by confessing that you're a sinner, what are you thinking? What's going through your mind? What's going through your heart as you say those words? I know they're printed out for you to read. But are you just reading the words? Or are you saying them and believing them in your heart? Because I think at times people who begin a worship service this way, which most Lutheran churches do, they're just saying words. That in their words they're saying, well God, I'm to blame, it's my fault. I've disobeyed you, but in their hearts, they're thinking the opposite. Oh, I'm a pretty good person. This past week, I've, I've been pretty good. I'm pretty pleased with myself. How about you? When you said those words of confession this morning, how did you feel about it? You should have felt totally unworthy. Unworthy to come to God, unworthy to come before his presence. John the Baptist, whom Jesus called the greatest man on earth, of course outside of himself being God, but God the Son Jesus called John the Baptist, there's been no greater. And yet even John the Baptist said of Jesus, the latchet of his shoes, I am not even worthy to unloose. Is that how you feel? Or more like when we say the general confession, in our hearts are we really saying this, Oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a great and holy person, a person who is important in the community, am not conscious of any wrong. I go to church. I give to the church. 
I give good things to my neighbors. I pray thee of thy boundless mercy. Recognize I have done better than a lot of other people. And if I've sinned, hasn't everyone? Is that what you're really saying in your heart? Even though the words say different? Most people I've found in life that I talk to about these things think that they're good people. And they are if you follow their standard. Most people's standard of good is, well, I'm just as good as other people. That's their standard. They look at other people, how other people seem to be living and talking, and what other people think. They think, well, I'm just as good as them. And that's their standard, that's their comparison. That is not confession. That is not humility. True humility and confession in the Bible's definition is not comparing ourselves with other people, it's comparing ourselves to God. Now you say, well, I've never seen God. How can I compare myself to him? Well, he's given you his word, the Bible. You can compare yourself to the Bible, God's standard. Compare yourself to God's law. Compare yourself to the Ten Commandments and their meaning explained throughout the Bible. This is what the Bible calls examining yourself. Seeing yourself as God sees you. For example, the first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And if you don't, you're lukewarm, and he will spew you out of his mouth. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That doesn't just mean ignoring the Bible and what it says. It means just saying, oh my God, or just throwing out the word of the Lord or Jesus and just thoughtlessly using it. You've never done that? You're pure? You're good? giving little attention to studying God's word to you and you think you're good? Ignoring what God says to you in the Bible? And how about in your families, in your households? How often do you study the word of God at home? How often do you take God's word and teach it to the others in your household, especially your children? Are you without guilt there? You think you've been doing that good? Thou shalt not kill. Well, they say, I, I, I've obeyed that. I've never killed anybody that I know of. But Jesus said, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, It's guilty of the judgment. You ever been angry? Can you say in all honesty in your soul, yeah, I've kept that commandment. Thou shalt not kill. Jesus takes it so far as to mean even love your enemies. Have you done that? Sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. You've never had lust in your heart? How about drunkenness? That's part of it. Bible talks against drunkenness. Thou shalt not steal. Wanting other people to support you. Not being responsible for yourself, but trying to get money 
from other people without giving them something of equal or greater value in return, like uh, fudging on your income tax so somebody else has to pay more tax. Maybe overclaiming on an insurance claim. How about gambling? Well, that's really loving your neighbor, isn't it? I want to get something from my neighbor and give him nothing back. I want to win from him. Betting, gambling, thou shalt not steal. Shalt bear false witness against thy neighbor. Gossip, looking for the worst in other people and spreading it around rather than praying for them. I could go on and on. And yet we stand here and think we're good? Just because other people are no better than us? We think? This is God's standard. And if we honestly look at ourselves by the light of God's law, we have nothing to be proud of. We shouldn't be haughty. Just the opposite. We should see ourselves in spiritual poverty and disgrace. Not pretty good. We should be, as the text tells us, we are the afflicted people. We have an affliction, and that affliction is sin. And it's a great affliction. We have it really bad. God says, you have not lived up to my glory. You've fallen short of my glory. The Bible says, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. Bible says, him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. So says God. If you're proud of yourself in any way that you think you've been pretty good or whatever before God, he's just going to bring you low. That's, that'll, be, that'll be your end. See, our efforts to be good in the eyes of Almighty Holy God are nil. Our supposed goodness counts for nothing before God. Everything in us by our sinful nature is condemned. We are by nature, the Bible says, children of wrath, meaning God's anger upon us. Anything that we have more than hell is by God's mercy. Let us kneel before Almighty God, our Creator, and implore Him by the power of God, the Holy Ghost, to let us see ourselves as God sees us. The Bible says, if we do that, we will say, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, O Lord, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. We have a great affliction. We should recognize that. It's called sin. It's called disobedience to God. We should confess it. And when we do, let us do it not just with words, but right from our hearts. There's a, there's a church building somewhere over in the, uh, in the Near East, I've read about. Uh, it's in the Palestine area, I think. Uh, it goes way back to the Middle Ages, its construction. And the circumstance under which this building was built was it was during the Crusades. It was when the Muslims had taken over the Holy Land. And 
the Christians were being persecuted by the Muslims there. And so when they built their, their buildings, their church buildings, they would sometimes build the, the door into the church building very low. That way the Muslims couldn't ride their horses into the church building during the worship service and wreak havoc among the Christians. So they put this very low door in their church building to keep the Muslims on their horses out. Well, this required the Christians entering into these church buildings to almost get down on their knees to get into church. And on this particular church building I'm speaking of, this door had a name. It was called Humility Gate. I think every Christian church ought to have such a door. That anyone who comes here comes with humility, bending down on their knees before God in confession of their sinfulness. Falling at the mercy of God. Humility gate. Humility, that's what the Bible talks about as the first step of salvation, the first step of faith. Confessing our sinfulness, not considering ourselves good, not even considering ourselves first, but consider yourself last. Consider yourself not even above a cold-blooded murderer in the eyes of God. That's what Paul did, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in the Bible called himself the chief of sinners. Now if Paul, the Apostle, called himself the chief of sinners, what does that make us? John Wesley on his 72nd birthday wrote in his diary God be merciful to me, a sinner. And then you have King David, who Psalm 51 we read earlier, who confessed, my sin is ever before me. I am poor and needy. There was a man who lived many centuries ago in Europe the name was Francis Borgia. He was born Duke of Gandia. He was born into wealth and into title, title of Duke. But as he grew up, he forsook that title. He went into a monastery, forsook all his wealth, took a vow of poverty, and he also forsook the title of Duke. And from then on, he signed his letters, not Duke Francis, but Sinner Francis. Francis the Sinner. That's how he signed his name to all his letters. As you read about Francis, he considered himself the worst of sinners. Uh, at one point in his life, he apparently categorized himself with Judas. But later on, he said, no, I'm worse than Judas. Because Jesus washed Judas' feet, and I'm not even worthy for that. He he would wake up in the morning, and the first thought that would go through his mind, he said, was, I am worthy of hell. And as he went through the day, and he maybe would walk out in public, he, these thoughts would go through his mind that all these people are looking at me and thinking, you big sinner, you. You ought to be in hell. Even the children and the animals, he said, were, were thinking that of him. 
Francis of Assisi, back in the Middle Ages, he was of the same mind. He thought of himself as the chief of sinners. A man once asked Francis of Assisi, what do you think of yourself? And he said, I think I am the worst sinner in the world. And the other man just had a shocked look on his face. You? The worst sinner in the world? What, what about the thieves and the murderers and the adulterers and the, the profaners and, the, and the, the godless people of the world? You're worse than them? You're a godly man. You believe in the true God and try to serve him. And you think you're worse than these other sinners? And Francis said, well, I think that if these other people had been shown all the mercy and grace that I have been shown by God, they would be more thankful than I am. Confession. Humility. The afflicted. That we are the afflicted ones afflicted by sin. But lest we be terrified of God because of our great sin, God promises us in this text, the afflicted people thou wilt save. There's the good news. God will receive you even though you are afflicted with sin. Why? How? By God himself taking all of your sin, every sin you've ever committed in thought, word, and deed, taking all of that sin off of you and putting it on himself. That's how. Because Jesus Christ is God. Come down from heaven, a perfect man, the perfect God-man who never sinned, but voluntarily took upon himself my sins, your sins, and the whole world's sins on himself, took full responsibility for them. The Bible says he became sin. God became the embodiment of human sin. And then God the Father looked down upon his only begotten Son and put him on a cross, forsook him, and slew him. And all the wrath and anger of God upon human sin fell upon God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son. A lot of people ask Jesus, how do we know that you are who you say you are? That you're God, our Savior? Jesus said, I'll give you one sign, one proof. I will be crucified, and three days later, I will rise from the dead. That's your proof. And so he did. And that is how, even though we're poor, miserable, afflicted sinners, God will save us. It's the only way. There's only one God. He only has one way of salvation. It's a sure way. It's putting our trust not in ourselves, but in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. We are the straying sheep. Jesus laid down his life to save us, and most assuredly he did. His resurrection proves us. And now, if we will confess we are afflicted people, that we cannot save ourselves, we come in humility before God, confessing our sins and believing that Jesus is God who saved us by his death. 
God will forgive us all our sins. All of our sins. God's message to you is this. Do not rely on yourself or you will be lost. God says, thine eyes are upon the haughty that thou mayest bring them down. But rather than relying on your sinful self, rely only on the mercy and grace of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. The Bible says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. The further you get from being proud of yourself, the nearer you will get to God in Christ Jesus. The Christ believer, the child of God bound for heaven, he must consistently look at two things. First, his own vileness, his own sinfulness. Secondly, the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. The only thing that we have to be proud of, Christ died for me. The book of John, written by God through the Apostle John, never refers to John. Isn't that interesting? He never refers to himself. Oh, but he does. But not by name. He refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. That's all he could be proud of. And that's all any of us can be proud of. Therefore, because Christ died for me, atoned for all of my sins before God's judgment seat, because of that alone, I am a child of God. My name is written in the book of life, and I will spend eternity in heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.